Zig coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have singer-songwriter Vashti Bunyan. I've been so excited about this interview. Not only is um, Vashti an amazing singer-songwriter, she's also an amazing writer. She wrote a book. It's called Wayward, uh, Just Another Life to Live. And it's about, I mean, it's a memoir. It's about her life. And it really dives into the journey that's documented musically on Just Another Diamond Day. The book um, goes into detail about everything that led to the adventure on Horse and Wagon and then to present day, learning about how this record impacted people and how she had no clue that it did. And throughout this book, there's so many like moments of perseverance and moments that illustrate the tenacity of her character. Like, for example, and like this is... a not a good description. You got to read the book to get the whole notion of the story and the narrative. But uh, she gets picked up by the Rolling Stones manager and is offered a, a recording contract, but she has to record songs written by other people before she can do her own. Her second one is written by a little person known uh, uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. And uh, she purposely sings it bad because she was told after recording one song written by the Rolling Stones, she'd be able to record her own. That's the most punk rock thing ever. Wayward is full of stories like that. And Vashti is one of the coolest singer-songwriters you need to know about. And if you're coming to this this episode not aware of who she is, all her music is available now on all the streaming platforms. Definitely recommend starting with Just Another Diamond Day and listening to everything else. At this point, I do got to make a public service announcement. If you're new to this podcast and you enjoy my banter, and you're like, oh, I wonder what that'd be like musically. I play in a band called C-Level, letter C-Level. We are a high-energy funk-punk reggae rock group based out of Cleveland. Um, We take 12-string acoustic guitars and run them through Marshall amplifiers and make exciting uh, music that is fueled by artists like Vashti. And we just put out a new album called Think For Yourself. It's available on all streaming platforms. Anywho... Um, talking to Vashti was so delightful. She was so kind, because I, I came in very hyped up. I just, I read the whole book, I listened to all the records, I listened to so many interviews, and found as much as the documentary as I could. There's a documentary out that shows a visual um, to the whole journey. And as well, in the mem- in the book, in the book, Vashti does a bunch of illustrations that also show the characters of the journey. Um... In Vashti, just like her music, there's this space around here. There's this 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 different tempo of the world, and like everything is very sincere and thoughtful. And I'm very very excited to share this interview with you guys. Last thing, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast and any of the podcast platforms, it really helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing their insight with you. So without further ado. Here's my conversation with Vashti. Well, and you, you captured it very eloquently, and it's very well written. Um, Thank you. And Thank it was, you. Uh, it, was, it was a read where I kept wanting to go into it. You know, like, and I think as an author, that's a really, that's a really important thing for, to capture a reader like that. And, like, you can do that with music. And, like, mm-hmm. sometimes I read memoirs that don't do the same thing as the tunes. So it was, it was very, very well done. Oh, good. Thank you. That's good to hear. But my first question is, I wanted to ask about um, Jenny Lewis. Uh huh. And how it was Jenny Lewis and Alice Strange, right? Who? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Angela Strange. Yeah. Angela Strange. Yeah. And how, like, uh, being with them and how they influenced you to write music? Ah, well, with Jenny, uh, we sh- we were both at, at the same art school. We became friends. Uh, I moved into a bed sit next to her on, in our second term. And, oh, I love your cat. Uh, <laughs> they're with me for everything here. <laughs> oh, cats. Um, <laughs> and she had a guitar. And okay. we both, start, well, I had had violin lessons at school, but I hated it. Uh, but it actually helped me to learn to play guitar. And we both learned together and we both started writing songs together. And um, we never really thought about recording them. But um, I, I, oh, Angie, 
uh, Angela Strange was my godfather's daughter, and she came to join us at the art school. Mm. And we all started singing together. But I got thrown out of the art school after two years um, because I was concentrating on writing songs rather than drawing and painting. And uh, so I left and I, I went on my musical journey and Jenny and Angie stayed at the art school and they started to sing together as a duo. And they, they recorded together as a duo. Uh, so our our trio, we called ourselves the, the three of us. Uh, we didn't last very long, but um, I think Jenny and I both started writing the same kind of songs. Uh, they were very sweet love songs, but they weren't all about how lovely love can be we were very young and we were discovering that it wasn't that great <laughs> it could be quite hard um and that's what we were writing about mostly i think our songs were quite quite similarly um i, I think we called them anti-love songs <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> Was it, well, I think that's super important. That, like when you meet someone like that, who encourages you to be because writing and like singing is like uh, it's very vulnerable and like putting yourself out there. So they get like a support group yeah. like that leads to yeah. leads to everything else. And when I get to that part in that book, I was like, I was was that like a natural thing? Like it just came up like between a shared love of music between you three, or like was it? because yeah. she was working on guitar and you're like, oh, that's cool. I want to do that too. Um, yeah, I was very taken with the, the look of the guitar, the feel of the guitar. Oh, it was just, it was just lovely to, to discover it, I suppose, to discover the guitar. And we both liked the same kind of pop music. Okay. You know, there was Buddy Lee and the Everly Brothers and all, all of those beautiful harmonies. And I think that really influenced our, our writing at the time. I don't know if Jenny would agree, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think yes, it definitely it was it was the pop music of the time that that uh, that inspired us and made us want to carry on from that to make it a little bit more real for for us. Um, but again, we we didn't really think about recording at that time. We just had fun writing and uh, making music and and singing together. That's awesome. That's such an important bit of the journey is that like musical like companionship. That's um, so really at the, yes. uh, on a side note, like so all the all the illustrations in the book, those are all yours. They are. Okay, yes, they're fantastic. So that okay. drawing stuck with you. Were, did you do that during the process of writing the book or was um, the sketches yeah. you've had? Uh, well, I started writing the book. A long, long time ago, in about you know, 93, 94, uh, as a way of trying to explain to my children what their upbringings <laughs> mean, what their parents had gone through. Um, and I did some drawings then. The, the more detailed drawings are from that time. I, I wrote a synopsis and I wrote a few chapters and I sent it off to publishers and of course, got nothing back at all. I mean, total silence. But I kept the drawings. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago in lockdown that I uh, I was approached by a publisher who knew that I had been writing some of the story. And I had the time and the encouragement uh, to actually get down to it and write the story. And I did some more drawings. I realized that actually I really do love drawing still. And uh, so I was able to do some more for the book. Because I reading the descriptions, like you describe everything, like I was saying before, very eloquently and very it's very clear. But just to kind of get that little pictorial at the end of like the I guess in my case the PDF, but like at the on the next page or what may be like, it really kind of illuminates that. And like, I I emailed oh. Howard halfway through my reading because I read somewhere there was a documentary, and like apparently it's in the ether or it doesn't it's not on anything. And like I was like, oh, I want to see this, you know, like, and I found right. some clips, some clips, and like, but the illustrations really did a good job of just like clearly cutting what what the carriage looked like and just like that, uh -huh. like the whole like a uh, uh, gang at that one point with the, <laughs> all the dogs and like, <laughs> yes. it was beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I need to uh, get back to Howard uh, because the the person who made that documentary, Kieran Evans, he has said that uh, I can give Howard um, some links. Oh, cool. To, because at the moment it's not out, and he and Kieran doesn't want it to sort of escape right, right. because he's trying to make a deal with a with a streaming company, and so. Uh, I, I will get his permission to get a link to Howard, and I, um, I'll get it to you as I well. I would love that. That'd be awesome. Because I found, I found I think, a nine-minute clip, and I'm like, oh, this would be perfect. Right. That's so cool. <laughs> uh, it's 90 minutes. The <laughs> <laughs> I got a uh, person. <laughs> but uh, did that process, like, so was was that, I, I imagine that came before the book, just because, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, was, it was Fifteen years ago, in fact, that we made that documentary. Okay. Yeah. So, did that kind of inspire? Were there some manuscripts writing uh, submitted for the yeah. the structure of the documentary that made its way into the book, or kind of shaped the book in a sense? I think the memories were jogged by okay. that, but the the idea of it was for Kieran and I to make the journey again by car and van, and um, it, it took. I think. We probably had four or five goes at it to do right from London all the way to the Outer Hebrides. And and so it was lovely revisiting some of the places I remembered and finding that yeah. they were actually the same. And so so it did it did I suppose solidify the memories for me. Uh, so it was okay. a, a, a wonderful thing to do. I'm really grateful to Kieran. Wow. And they do it like multiple times. I mean, I guess like the kind of like because the journey itself had to be so like arduous by horse <laughs> like <laughs> so they do it <laughs> multiple times i'm sure like uh, maybe it was like to, to be able to take in different things like mm -hmm. and you know just by mode of transportation and tempo of travel like had to be yes. very interesting um, it was really interesting to to be that slow or to be just at the the horse's pace or, or our walking pace all the way up throughout England and into Scotland and out to the outer islands to see how this tiny island of, of the UK, the changes from the south to the north and all, all through these different places uh, was extraordinary to me and a great education to understand how different people can be to each other in, in, in areas. And the other thing that happened was uh, because we traveled right th through into the winter, we didn't notice the change in the temperature or the change in the season particularly because it was happening so slowly as we were going along. And that, that, that was fascinating to me. That, uh, and to, to, be, to be on the ground, to be living on the ground was... Uh, a great education for me. That's it's interesting because, like, when you kind of dial that, like, w listening to just another diamond day and hearing, like, when I listen to your music, there's this, like, there's it, it, the tempo itself. I kind of I think reflects that. Like, there's like a certain breath to your music that I think emulates that kind of appreciation. And like, it, it at least it takes me into a space where I'm like stuck for a moment in a good way this like appreciate it's like uh like when a, a poet hears a word that inspires a poem or a photographer sees an image and captures it it's like going through your records getting ready for today like it it drops you in that breath of like whew, stuff's moving and but it's it's moving at a different yeah. tempo so i i after reading um your memoir that really is reflected in your music and I think even a little bit before too, uh -huh. with like yeah. the, the recordings coming before it. But like, um, yeah, I, I think I, I wrote a lot of the songs uh, on the journey to comfort myself, to keep myself going. And I think a lot of the songs are kind of rocking, like you would rock a baby, and um, and you have to slow down because we we had to slow down. You know, we were we were. We were going ten miles a day at the very most. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that is reflected in 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 the songs that that uh, 
life had to get slower and we had to focus on different things, you know, on, on immediate needs like the, the horse needed water, the horse needed grass, we needed wood for the fire, we needed to stop the dog from getting run over and, and you know, it, all of those immediate things. You had to had to really slow down and come down into the immediate moment. And our, I think that's maybe in the songs that um, it, it, to be able to listen to the songs. And, and when when the record first came out in 1970, I think people were way too speedy yeah. to actually um, get down in, into the way that the songs were. And I think that was why it didn't work. But maybe people are more able now to to to, to get to get into the way of the songs and to get into the slowness and to get into the uh, well. I've been told that it comforts babies and are uh, and people who are having a hard time have written to me to say that it actually helps. And uh, I, I I had. A wonderful letter from a parent of an autistic child yeah. who uh, never spoke, but he could sing the words. Ah, uh, no way. What song do you recall? <laughs> no, I don't. It's a while ago. But I should look out that, that message because it was wonderful um, to think of being able to do that for yeah. someone. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> it's Well, the, there's, a, I think, because of that, like, also, like, like I think of like bands like the Ramones or something, right? Something very fast paced. Like I, I don't want to do this. Blah. Next song. I do want to do this. Blah. Fast thought, fast music, you know, just like do, 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 do. And, but they're, they're also from New York city that life is boom, 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 you know? And like a lot of, like a lot of, a lot of living is like that. A lot of living is thing, 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 thing. And that have this amazing journey where you can reflect on the things as they come. I think that's what's so impactful about about your music is it takes you to that space and allows that. Um, one thing, oh, I, I um, hope so. It, yeah. At least for me, that's what it does. And one thing I, I found really fascinating about you as a character or your character um, at one point in the book, it may have been near the end. Uh, Diamond Day comes out. There's a couple reviews. One of which someone said it made them feel depressed, and then you're like, "I'm out." And like, I was like, t for someone to like care that much about what their music does, I think speaks more, you know, way more impactfully. And like, and to, to hear right now, like, about all these letters that are coming out to people that have been affected positively by it, it's like as yeah. many as yeah. like, I'm sure the industry, and you can probably tell me um, uh, more succinctly on it, is is looking for that kind of fast paced nature, but people are also want that, that space, that blip of beauty that takes you to that moment. And maybe that is kind of reflected in the early songwriting about like the anti love songs and like, kind of like yes. learning what does, you know, like maybe that's coming from that too. But like, mm -hmm. uh, um, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, but I'm, I think yeah. for every one person who may have been bummed out, there's a million that were inspired and that's, I'm so glad to hear that you're hearing that. Well, yeah. And I think for me that 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 review where the guy said that it had made him feel depressed, it just it was such a shock to me because although I didn't have the words to describe what I had been going through before before taking off with the horse and cart, I know that that was a depression that I went through and I wouldn't have had the words for it. But then to read that, that I'd made somebody unhappy uh, it, it was just a real shock. I thought that I was trying to get out of that, you know, and trying to, to move on from being unhappy. And to think that I had made somebody unhappy with the songs was... Uh, I closed that paper that the the review was in and vowed I would never pick up my guitar again. And I didn't. Mm. It was that effective. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe... Maybe I should have just shrugged it off, but I couldn't. Um, it really affected uh, my musical life or lack of for the next 30 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also just, I, I feel I encounter a lot of people that 
maybe don't accept change or commit to change. You know what I mean? And think I so I think the ability to be like, I am done with this next thing is so like anxiety provoking and scaring for a lot of scary for a lot of people that they don't do it you know and yeah. maybe that's that leads to some other issues or the comfort the ability to leave comfort is such an empowering thing and yeah yeah i i think i i think looking back on my young self and i think god you were so brave you had such courage you you were able to make that complete change and leave everything behind. But at the time, I didn't feel brave. I didn't feel courageous. I was just doing what I had to do. Or, or the only thing that I felt was open to me, which was to leave, mm. to just go and uh, and try to make a completely different kind of life. But, you know, looking back, I think, wow, that was good. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> But at the time, I, I didn't think of it like that at all. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to go and do this brave thing. Right. I just I, I'm going to go and do this thing. <laughs> and, uh, I also think that's important too, because like at the moment, it, it, it shouldn't seem like you're 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 uh, in this in the hero's journey, like accepting the moving on. Uh, you know, the call to adventure. You're like, in your case, yeah. wasn't it um, because of blue? Right. Um, I love to keep my dog and to keep my sanity <laughs> i think yeah it was a way of being able to keep keep my dog definitely and 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 in some ways i think i said this to the publisher of the book you know the dog saved my life um but i didn't put that in yeah and but i do think it i think a, a lot of it was you know what would he do without me and uh so in that way, yes, he, he did keep me going. Dogs do that. You know, it's it's interesting having the care for, like, an animal. Like, or, you know what I mean? Like, it really kind of, for me, like, the two cats you saw running around, like, my life is always <laughs> going, 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 like, from teaching the gig to teaching, like, it's nonstop. And so is everybody's. Uh -huh. But, like, the moments I can just be here and be, like, with them, it it. it brings me to that it, oh, what your music kind of the space your music kind of takes me to it takes me to that moment oh. of being here and like just everything that you need is right here and I th uh, animals have such a impactful way of doing that oh they sure do <laughs> they sure do and you've got two cats yeah i got two and their brothers yeah. they're, they're nuzzled up somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, oh, that's yeah well it, yeah they can make a they have a huge influence on your life and um yeah I, I really miss having having an animal around i live in the city and it wouldn't be fair but i borrow a daughter's dog every so often and when when anybody in the family needs to go away they 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 bring us their cats <laughs> i really love it i love having that presence yeah. it makes it makes the, uh, the whole house feel different you know, when, when, the, when there's a, a creature that needs, that needs stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 I don't know what it is. It's just a simple thing, but it's like it's the essence of caring or giving someone that care. Is that, a, is that kind of the what's, – what's the lineage of a looking after? It's look aftering, uh, yeah. Look aftering, ah, I yeah, knew I'd mix yeah. it up. Exactly. Well, that is exactly what we were just saying, yeah. And yeah. that's what, what led to it. It was a, a a word that my family came up with. My kids, you know, just um, uh, we we need to be doing a bit of look aftering um, when somebody needed something or there was something that needed taken care of. Uh, and when we were mastering that album it was my second album and it was 35 years after my first we were mastering it and it didn't have a title yet um and i i just said you know well it had occurred to me during that time that just another diamond day was all about looking forward and and it was just it was so hopeful um and the songs on look after him were a lot of them were about looking back over mm -hmm. things and, and i thought it was like like bookends and I thought well look aftering that's the same you know it could be about looking after something or it could be about looking back mm. um, and that's why at, at that session <laughs> we decided that it would be called look aftering and yeah it's a completely made up word but for me it it, um, 
it did describe the album. Yeah, that's beautiful, and I think it. I think it does. So, like, um, there was in between the kind of. There's a couple of questions I want to ask about the journey before the journey. So, when you, yeah. uh, um, oh, I got her name, um, Miss Mackey. Oh yes, Mrs. Mackey. Yeah. So when she heard, so you were doing uh, after after art school, you're doing the kind of the bar circuit in a way, like uh, yeah, which. I, I do all the time, and I totally related to that struggle, just being the noise in the background, and it's oh, yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> it really is. It really is. It just oh yeah, terribly difficult. But I, this time I was at a party of my mother's friends, who were all theatrical people, um, and I had taken my guitar. And I was asked to sing a few songs. And, you know, again, there were people just milling around and drinking and and making noise. But this woman, Monty Mackey, she was an agent um, and she knew Andrew Lou Goldham, the manager of the Rolling Stones. And Marianne Faithful had just left his management. Mm. And Monty Mackey thought, ooh, <laughs> This this person looks a bit like her, and she's and she's got a little voice, and she's you know they're a bit similar. And she introduced me to Andrew, uh, which was it, it was wonderful in that I I was given a Rolling Stones song, a Mick Jagger Keith Richards song as my first single. Yeah. But on the other hand, the the press at the time just got a hold of the idea that I was a replacement for Marianne Faith. Okay. And and that that was really hard for me because I thought well I write my own songs I'm you know she doesn't write her own songs <laughs> she's blonde I'm not and she's incredibly clever I'm not <laughs> and <laughs> it, it, the, the comparison really um undermined me and un- undermined my own confidence in my own self but you know that's that's history and that was the way it went um and the single didn't work anyway so and I, I I made some more recordings um, of my own songs, but they weren't released, mm. apart from one called Train Song, which has done really well recently, but not at, at the time. Um, but yes, that, that that was why I took off and left. I was I was done. Well, you know, each time I made a recording that was going to be a single, I thought, this is it. This is going to take me where I want to go. I wanted my own simple songs into the top 20, you know, in, into the, I just wanted, I wanted it to, to work as something simple and something, I don't know, something quiet, right. you know, and uh, something that wasn't bombastic like everything else that seemed, seemed to be around me. Um, and when each time I thought it was going to work and each time it didn't, they didn't release it. And after three goes of that, over probably about a year, uh, I thought, ah, I can't be any good at this. I'm not any good at this. I must be rubbish. So I'll just leave it all behind. Because mm. so mm. like in that, that process of it, it's, there's so many like, like it's a bureaucracy of sending one thing. And it's, it's different than when you just write and perform it and like see the reaction. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, but to get that like to uh, the place where it can be performed you know you need the recorded bit it's all part of the thing um so yeah it's, were the stones like as as big as they were are then like were at that point okay so this was like we, this is rad yep. we're in okay so yep. like sorry i didn't <laughs> you, mean to talk over you <laughs> yeah no really uh, that that's how it felt to me because I didn't want to record their song. I wanted right. to record my songs, but it was it was a way in, as you say. And uh, I, I thought, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, but yeah, it didn't work. I mean, listen, like reading that part of it and knowing that you wanted to do your own thing, and like then reading the personnel that were on that recording, like Jimmy Page played guitar on it, and like there's some <laughs> like heavy hitters on there, and like. Yeah. And then, or even the part with Jimmy Page's song, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, so yeah. how how would that work? They would like each they would submit a song to be recorded by someone else, or or they would write a song, yeah. want to record it, kind of like what happened with you, and someone else would. Was it yeah. something like that? 
Well, Jimmy Page was a session musician, and he was also, uh, I suppose, he, yeah, he, he was um, he was asked, asked by Andrew Oldham to write a song uh, and that I would record it. And I, I was, I don't remember the song in any way, and thank goodness there's no record of it, because I sang it really badly, because I was pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> And I was given somebody else's song to record. And actually, the the first, I don't know if you've got the book or the photograph that's on the front of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, that was taken just as Jimmy Page walked past me on the staircase. Yeah. I was looking at him thinking, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, and that was the photograph that the publisher chose to go on. <laughs> In a way, that's perfect. I think that's perfect. Because yeah. reading that, I'm like, okay, well, you know, also at the t- you know, the these are people, this is a studio guy. I think that that itself, and I'm sure it was more frustrating than inspiration, like mm-hmm. to be like, I want to do my thing. You know, I, I'm recording a Stone song, whatever. I want to do my thing. I think that is so inspiring. And that is like the coolest, like, like I want to be that kid in school. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> She's cool. Like, to be able to ha- believe in what you're doing that sincerely um, mm-hmm. and it's to be like, whatever. I'm Jimmy Page, who? You know, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, and I get right. he was a studio guy at the time, you know, but still, like, yeah. that's. So, yeah, it was quite something. But, yeah. oh dear, yeah. Well, a long time ago. <laughs> um, so, also kind of talking about Train Song, that was like, that was inspired, or some lyrics were put to music from a poet who would who would trouble you, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Jenny, Jenny Lewis and I had written a song called 17 Pink Sugar Elephants. And and then, uh, yes, I, I met this poet, Alistair Clare, actually, on a train, which was quite amazing. Um, and he kept um, writing poems for me and putting them in the milk bottle at my door. And I, I wasn't terribly impressed by him at all. He was much older than us. Probably, he was probably about 30. Oh. <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> I was... I was so mean to him. But anyway, <laughs> well, that, that, I think that wasn't. That's not our. That's that's an okay like, situation. I feel. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but <laughs> but the word, his train song words fitted the tune of Jenny's and my Pink Sugar Elephants song, and I put the two together. And I met this Canadian uh, producer called Peter Snell, and he bought me out of. Andrew's contract and we recorded Train Song with just a cello and a double bass and two guitars and it was exactly what I wanted it was really what I wanted to do and to sound like and it was out on Columbia uh, but nobody ever played it on the radio apart from once um, there was a pirate radio out in <laughs> out in the English Channel yeah. um, and they, they, they played it once and that was it. So of course, nothing ever happened to it at all until it was taken up for, for adverts and commercials. And, you know, it, yeah. just in the last in the last 15 years, I guess, it has been used quite a lot. And for me, that's amazing. Having been told all of my young life that my music was not commercial, to have uh-huh. it used yeah. commercials, it was just, it was, it was, an extraordinary feeling, um, and Diamond Day as well was used for a T-Mobile com- commercial and made a lot of people very cross with me. But I thought, no, no, no. I, I it vindicates that young girl who was told how uncommercial she was. Yeah, actually, the songs were okay. <laughs> the songs worked. That's beautiful. That's oh, that. That's the thing, yeah. like that. In that case, that's that's the punk rock flag. This works. You're wrong. <laughs> like uh, that's uh, this one thing. Like I, I, I don't think that doesn't ruin the music. A lot of people are really troubled by that, and like it sounds like you experienced. But 
if anything, yeah. it's sharing it with more people, you know, and like, and yeah. making sure you get to eat, like, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. They got my my youngest son uh, to college in America. <laughs> He got a, a basketball scholarship, but it didn't. It was just a half half scholarship, and so Diamond Day actually enabled him to go to college in America um, to carry on his life there. That's so amazing. that you know, it was it was okay for me and for him. <laughs> Did um, <laughs> you, was that the son that repaired your guitar that was smashed on the way to Diamond Day? No, no, that's my oldest son, okay. and he lives okay. in California still. Um, uh, yeah, he's he's still got it, and it's beautiful. It's lovely. I've got a lovely photograph as well of my grandson, his son Riley, playing it, um, which has you know come since since I wrote the book, um, and so it's alive and well, which is really really good for me to know. That that part really resonated in your memoir, reading about the nightmare of them replacing the tuning pegs. Uh -huh. I was like, yeah. I get that. <laughs> oh man, uh -huh. it was extraordinary, and it was a dream. It was yeah. a, it was a nightmare, and it turned out to be true. Yeah, that it ha he had done it. He had replaced what I would call the machine heads at, at the top of this beautiful old, old guitar. You know, they were uh, ivory and, and brass and they were beautiful. And he had replaced them, This the, the guy who was repairing my guitar, he had replaced them with ones that looked like they should have come off a country and western guitar. They were bright white plastic and bright silvery chrome and so wrong. But yeah, when, when my son grew up he um he repaired it he, he he found he got the old the old ones we'd kept the old ones all yeah. through the year and he he put them back and wow it was wonderful to have it back was being that, being right again you know yeah well it just th there's so much of the story that is told with the the wear and tear on the instrument it, it's that's been through every gig that went through every mile <laughs> Um, that wrote every song that held together the 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 four four tuning so blank could <laughs> exist. Um, did uh, did he do that while you were recording your uh, uh, your first album back? Was that kind of during the process of that, or was it, was this after? Like, I'd be interested to like if that was the 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 the, the accident happened. That the, no. the, the, the the tuners were. Or were um, were replaced. Right, right. That that, yeah, that was after, after we'd made just another Diamond Day, um, because Joe Boyd had told me, oh, well, that guitar got run over. Right. On the way to Do making it. the set to to the recording sessions, for Diamond Day, and Joe Boyd knew somebody who could repair it for me, um, but this this person who repaired it. <laughs> uh, Kind of um, unrepaired it, <laughs> yeah. but but yeah, it, it it came back together. Yes, it's sixteen years later was when my son oh, okay, okay. Uh, put together but, again. Yeah, wow, that's so awesome. Um, one thing that I found interesting with uh with so when Joe, so you went in and you recorded Diamond Day. Uh, when you're doing that, were you just doing vocals and guitar? Or what was the other orchestra? Okay, so you didn't hear any of the orchestration until they're like, "Here you go." Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, it was just three evenings that we recorded those songs, and uh, I didn't. I'd been on the road for a year and a half. I had I had no access to the radio or to music papers, and so I had no idea who the Incredible String Band were. I didn't know who Fairport Convention were. I didn't know who Nick Drake was. I didn't know anything about any of the other people in Joe Boyd's stable. And uh, when he brought in Robin Williamson uh, to play um, on some of the songs, I didn't know who he was, and I didn't know his music, and so. And the same with Dave Swarbrick and Simon Nicol from Fairport Convention. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know their music. And so when it all started to come together with banjos and mandolins and, and fiddle music, it wasn't what I had in mind at all. But 
I think it was maybe the second evening that Robert Kirby came in. And Robert Kirby was the one who had done all the arrangements on Nick Drake's songs. And what he did for strings and recorders was what I had in mind, much more that, that kind of classical feel rather than the folky feel. And so it was really quite hard for me. And, and also, I'd only ever played by myself with my guitar and to have other musicians around me. Some of it was great. Some of it I loved. But some of it, I thought, um, this isn't me. And I've said it a few times, actually, that back then, the producer was God. And he didn't, well, somebody shy like me wasn't going to say, um, could we not have the banjo on? <laughs> could, we, could we take the violin off that one? Because I don't really think it suits it. And, you know, so three nights, then I went away back to the Outer Hebrides and I didn't hear the mixes that, that Joe did. Yeah. Another, so it would have been about eight months later that I got an acetate demo of what the album was going to be. Uh, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't what I had in mind at all. And it's taken me all these years to actually be able to accept what Joe did and to even come to love what it was back then. Although I couldn't, I couldn't relate to it back then. It didn't feel like me yeah. at all. Um, but now I think, well, actually, it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I find interesting is like the kind of the call to like the classical music. Does that come from wanting to be the choir boy that goes, oh, in the <laughs> in the Beethoven? Wings of a dove. Yes, definitely. My father had a lot of wonderful old classical records and, you know, in the <laughs> uh, yeah, 78s, my goodness very fragile but yes they were what i loved when i was growing up and definitely the choir boy who sang oh for the wings of a dove i wanted to be that choir boy and i think probably that was what developed my voice because it does have that kind of that kind of feel of, of the choir boy i desperately wanted to be a boy but yeah um yeah it yeah, it, it had a huge effect, that, that particular song, you know, and it was recorded in the 1920s. <laughs> but, but so it goes. So it goes. That's incredible. Um, one kind of like on the, the topic of all this, like the string, like it's uh, like uh, like folk instruments. There, there's a banjo player you mentioned, Daryl Adams. And I thought oh, yeah. he was really profound in your journey. Yes, definitely, definitely, yes, because, our, yeah, I, I met him at a time that I was, uh, feel, well, I had just been in a bar, like we talked before, where uh, um, people were talking and drinking and making a noise and nobody was listening to me, and I fled the stage in tears. This was in Ghent, in Belgium, and the barman was a really nice guy and he said, oh, well, don't worry about it and gave me my fee anyway and said, oh, there's a musician staying upstairs in, a, in some rooms above the pub and uh, you should go and see him. And I went up and I realized it was Daryl Adams, who I had met once before. And he, he was... Uh, he was so kind. My goodness, he was so kind. And we had him play his banjo, and he said he would play the banjo if I would sing a song. And so I did. And after that, he said, and I had told him how desperate I was and how, how I, did, I never wanted to set foot on stage again. I never wanted to have anything to do with music ever again. And he said, don't hide your light. And... I remembered his words, and I tried not to. Um, and that was when I met Joe Boyd, just after that journey, okay. and just after after meeting Daryl Adams. Is that and, sorry? No, is is at the time like you guys were like uh, around crashing with or staying with Donovan? Is that like around that kind of? No, okay. We hadn't reached it yet. That oh, okay. that was half 
through that was halfway through the the horse journey i was offered a tour in holland and belgium which didn't turn out to be quite what i had in mind but um yeah that was halfway through the journey i thought i could earn some money but no it didn't work out like that but um that was on on my way back to the horse and the wagon uh via london i was introduced to joe boyd okay. and i him some songs and he said he wanted to by the time we got to donovan's place yeah which be probably nine months or so away (laughs) he he would like to make an album of the songs if i had written some more by then and it was another year until we actually made the recording so that that made things difficult as well because you know by from the, the year i wrote the songs to when they were recorded was a year and then another year till it was released. So, you know, it missed its window, yeah. really. Um, like you were saying before, things were moving really, really quickly by the end of the 60s into the 70s. Whoa, it was very different. Was it, um, it's another, like, just even traveling and writing, like, for, uh, me, I need to record every little bit I do, or I, I, my brain can't handle. Like it's gone. How that, how that melody go? Ah, crap. And maybe, maybe it's a product of the fast living. Like, okay, classes now. Okay, work then. You know, da 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 da. Um, but as you're traveling, writing songs, where do, or do you? Is there like a bunch of iterations of these songs in the ether? And the, okay, so it just stuck. Okay, that's yeah. That's and very I wish impressive. I could do that. I'm more like you now, you know. If I if I if I can't record it and put it down, then it's lost, it's gone. So I don't remember how I did that. How? Well, I didn't have any way of recording yeah. them. Of, so so I had to remember. <laughs> maybe maybe brains work in a different way when they don't have access to recording. I think so. I think that I think or just even at the tempo of life at that point, you know, you have time to recall every step. Like yes. Yeah. Did, did you um so when you guys eventually get the donovan do you like like because you talk about uh, briefly in the weird interactions that happen there but like with donovan did you guys like ever talk about songwriting and music or is that just no okay i never talked to anybody <laughs> <laughs> i was about as quiet and withdrawn a person as you could possibly meet but no i you know there was a I think the only person I ever talked to about writing songs and music was Keith Richards. Yeah. In Andrew's office one day, he was he was sitting behind the secretary's desk with his feet up on the desk and just sort of fiddling around with the guitar. And I was waiting to talk to Andrew. I sometimes used to wait for hours to talk to Andrew, but actually we got into conversation about about writing songs and about music and i wish i could remember it what he said and what i said but it was a lovely lovely moment to to remember the first time and probably the only time that i talked to somebody who wrote songs um that i admired and uh it was great really good nice memory did so like what even though the the advice or the like kind of bits in that conversation may have fled the the leaving moment was like inspired or yeah i think so that that yes but it's worth it <laughs> it's it's been going you know it is yeah. worth it oh, that's amazing yeah. um another when i when i really started to get into songwriting one of the first profound like songwriters that inspired me to listen in different ways and hear emotion in different contexts and like really open my mind to a whole different style of art was Dravendra Banhart. And I knew you were going to say Dravendra. I mean, I knew. it's oh. hard. His his music is so encompassing, and his character is so like it to me. That is that is art. When I think of someone who wants to inspire me to look at things deeper in a way, um, or look at things that may be a sketch, or like may may like I, I go to a Devendra man uh, mindset and. Like, but so so how did how did Devendra come into your life and how did you start working with him a little bit it sounds like on his stuff and on your stuff yeah well it, it was it was amazing really because it might not have happened at all that he <coughs> he found my found Diamond Day in in a shop in Paris when he was really having a hard time 
and it meant something to him. And he wrote to me via the, the record label. Uh, he sent a tape and some drawings in an envelope, in the, and it sat on the label person's desk for a long time. Um, eventually, he said, oh, I suppose I better send that to Vashti. Mm-mm. Okay, so he sent it to me, and it was all covered in coffee stains, <laughs> and it obviously there for a long time. And when I opened it, I just and when I heard Devenger's first songs that he probably recorded on on answering machines and anything that he could get his hands on, um, it just meant so much to me. And his drawings just meant so much to me. And in his letter, in his accompanying letter, he was asking me if he should carry on. It was worth him keeping going. Uh, so of course I, I, and there was an email address, and so of course I wrote straight to him, say yes, please, I love what you're doing, and please keep going, and, and then the next thing was to, um, to add a vocal, to a, his, uh, was just, oh, it was incredible for me to be able to record it here, and send it across to him, uh, you know, at, at a time when I had only just started to record on, on, on the computer and uh, yeah I think actually hang on a sec um, yeah <laughs> oh boy I've got it here I've got what he um, sent me was, yeah the song was rejoicing in the hands there. Oh wow! Yeah, and That's uh, incredible. It, it was great. It was so yeah. great to be able to do that with him. And then when I met him, he came to to Scotland on tour with Michael Gira, and uh, and we met. And it was great. I, I just ever since we've we've just had you know a backwards and back and forth kind of relationship. He's recorded on my songs, I've recorded on his, and we've just done one together yeah. um, just last week. Oh, so yeah? It's been a wonderful, you know, wonderful... Ugh, every time he writes his, writes an email, it's so full of exclamation marks and, and, and love. <laughs> so it's, he's an extraordinary person, an extraordinary, unique artist, and I'm very uh, grateful to have met him and, and to have ha, just to have that backwards and forwards um, relationship with the songs and the music and with him is lovely, really good. One, one of the best things to have happened, you know, one of the best. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's so cool. That, but to, to have that, that's that's kind of going back to the uh, Jenny Lewis in a way, like to have or to have that songwriting excitement with somebody to be like, this work, you know. Yeah. What I mean, to have someone to share the uh, the uh, the expression expression and kind of get behind the idea is so like to know someone's got your back in a way musically and like emotionally to express is so empowering. That's like, that gets you through all the bad bar gigs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like gets you through. <laughs> the bad bar gigs. That's love. I'm going to write that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. My goodness. Yeah. That's but, right. Oh, well, wow. The thing is that I've never, Actually, apart from with Jenny Lewis, I've never actually written a song with somebody. I've I've recorded with somebody and I, I've uh, added added things, but I've never actually sat down with another person to write a song. And I would love to be able to do that. There's something I don't know if you can do that. Can do do you collaborate on the actual writing of songs, um, or do you just occasionally yeah. keep it to yourself? Um, you do. Kind, I'm starting to because like. Uh, my personal and I think writing approach is kind of probably it sounds similar. It's very like I'll, I'll sit down for an hour and I'll just try to write some to get a song seed out. Something will pop out and I'll try to write on that and yeah. just like improvise until something comes out. But it's a very personal like I will sound very bad in my recorder for hours until something comes out and then I bring it to the group. Um, right. But I've off recently I found myself in situations with students 
where they're like, let's write a song. And I'm like, oh, how do I get this process out of my head to mm. this to engage with someone else? And like one of which was I did a in 2020, um, a, a student of mine uh, wanted a service dog. Right. And they had a little GoFundMe type thing. And this really? company and they're like nine thousand dollars. They're pretty, pretty intense. And like. Uh so I put together a week long concert series of like streamed in in person concerts and like we got a bunch of media for it. It was really cool and we raised nine thousand dollars in a week. And oh, um, he finally got his dog. It's been trained and you know through twenty twenty all these hang ups, but he finally got his dog a couple months ago and she's coming to school with him and it's super like, and he's been so jazzed and he's, he's like a, he's a, he's like a, a kid that he likes, I like, I like to work on, I, I like to build things with wood, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. but he had an interest in guitar. So we would, we would sit and like, I would show him stuff and he's like, I want to write a song about my dog. Mm -hmm. He's like, I, and he, because of the whole concert thing, he knew I did music and I shared that with him in that sense. Like sometimes I'd, my other band members, they may say things that aren't school appropriate, so I don't necessarily say, look at Mr. Dave's band. <laughs> um, but he, uh, so we would hang out, and like we're starting the right lines. I'm like, well, the dog's name's Luna. And I'm like, well, what does the moon do? And try, I'm trying to find ways to like write lines where we can put it to music, and I've never thought of it in that way. So to answer that question, I've only recently have attempted to. And I don't know. I don't know if it's good or not, but it's definitely fun. Good. Yeah. Well, I, I really wish that I could do that. You know, I'm such a control freak and I'm so selfish, really, that I've never been able to do that, to actually sit down with somebody else and, and uh, put in ideas together. Maybe it'll come. Maybe it's something that I still have to do. But I, I was just interesting, interested if you were able to do that or not um so um, far i don't have an end result <laughs> but the process is kind of the process i think is a little not, more fun because of the context of it <laughs> oh, yeah. sure, i'm sure that sounds great um really but what about writing for people because you were like at one point i guess was it joe who asked you to write something for nick drake uh, no, he asked us to write something together. Oh, so uh, there, I guess this goes yeah. right on topic with that. <laughs> That's why I can't do it. Because, yeah, I went to his house. I had a tiny baby who was maybe two, three months old. And by the time I picked up my guitar, the baby would cry. So I had to pick up the baby. And then and Nick was at his piano with his back to me. And I could see, I mean, neither of us were communicative people. We were both ridiculously painfully shy. And so, of course, we never spoke to each other or anything helpful like that. And he was sitting at his piano doodling away and I was trying to deal with the baby. And I could see his shoulders going higher and higher and higher. And I knew that it was not going to work. Um, we just we gave up. I can't actually remember how we ended <laughs> the session. But, but yeah, it never happened. And I don't know how Joe thought that, you know, Joe knew me and he knew Nick. He knew what we were like. So I don't know how he thought that we could actually um, collaborate on something. But he then asked me to write a song for Judy Collins and I, I half wrote it. This was after Diamond Day came yeah. out and. Uh, um, and I was already feeling, no, that uh, this isn't for me. I'm going to leave it all behind again. Um, and I never did finish it. Uh, so, yeah, that's another one. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's hard because, like, at least if it's your song, I can get behind if you like it or not. I can get behind if it's good or not because it's my expression, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you put yeah. that for someone else or, like, it's it's interesting with, like, like, that, I don't if he knew, like, if Joe knew you or Nick's personalities, maybe he thought, like, the two will combust into something, something that would, you would, two opposites will attract in that sense. Like, they'll uh, be an amazing song. Because musically, I agree. That would be, that would have been incredible. Um, yeah. But, like, yeah. Uh, to kind of pick at that for a moment, was that kind of like, was there, like, a, a thing brought up, like, oh, let's write about this? Or was it just, like, shoulders getting up? Nothing? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible, absolutely terrible. That would definitely make it hard to write with other people if the first person you're supposed to write with is Nick. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, and and yeah, at that time I had not, I didn't know his music at all, and he doesn't know mine. So, um, yeah, it was never going to work. That was probably better to like come into it like, oh, this is yeah. just Nick. What's up, guy? You know. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if we even said hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, That's, that definitely does sound horrible. <laughs> oh wow. Um, did so, like with your own, <laughs> with your own like writing. The kind of like, is is it inspiration driven? Like, do you only, do you have like a a thing you do where like, maybe, maybe this is more practical for a book, like, Mm -hmm. but do you have like a set time? Like, I'm going to take five minutes out of my day to think about something and write something or dabble with the guitar or piano and like, or is it more like something pops in your mind? Yeah, something something pops in my mind. I, I think that if I, you know, a lot of writers and a lot of musicians say, OK, from nine o'clock until 1230, I'm going to be working and then I'll have a break. And then from 230, say, till five, I'll, I'll be working. I could never do that. Not ever, <laughs> ever, ever. You know, if, it, if I feel like sitting down with my guitar, I will sit down with my guitar. But mostly it just it, it, it'll come into my head or it won't. And I can't force it and I can't force that that place you have to be in really to to, to be <laughs> right. to, to what's out there. My daughter's a painter and she feels the same exactly the same that it, that it she can't just do it like a day job that she has to be in the right frame of mind to be able to do her paintings which are incredibly detailed and are that, that if somebody walks in or somebody want, phones up to want a cup of coffee or something like that, it sort of spo- it blows it all apart. Yeah. You've got to really be in it. And uh, I think I find it really much harder now to get into that place where um, you're able to to find words and to find the music and to find something new, something that you haven't done before. And it was strange when I was writing the last song that's on my last album, Heart Leap. At the time I was writing it and it came through, I thought, you know, th- this is the last thing I'm ever going to write. It's, it's saying everything I ever wanted to say and it just came all by itself. So, you know, is it ever going to happen again? And I don't think it really has. I haven't written a whole song since that one. So... Well, I have written a book, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different. That's a different headspace. Oh. Like you can say a book's worth of of material maybe in one line of a song in a way, like. Oh, yeah, that's what I really like about songwriting. Yeah, it, it as that condensing of of an emotion or a feeling or a story into just a few lines, and. I had tried to do that with the book as well, to make it not dwell too much on things, not to labor things too much, but just to give an idea or a picture uh, rather than rather than a whole <laughs> uh, library. Um, I, I just and I like that. Well, that's what I used to strive for in my songs was to. To, to make them concise and to, to have a line make as much sense as, as you say, as a whole book. You know, uh, that's what I really like, like to try to do. Well, I definitely think you do. One, and uh, I, uh, one more, I, I, I very, very much appreciate your time. I've been very much looking forward to this conversation um, oh. since since Howard sent me the the initial ask, and then the, be followed up with the book. And so, oh. Fashti, thank you so much. Um, but You're very on welcome that, on that conciseness. One song that, like the other day, I was driving and even like talking out loud with my girlfriend about it. Like, um, I would like to take a walk in your mind. Like oh. the the 
the concise of every line, and even when the key change happens and down to the minor chord, the lines that follow that and that like tag at the end, like it's perfectly put out as far as you know, like emotionally, it's all right there. Um, can you talk yeah. about a little bit of the story about how that song came to be? Yeah, I, I think that's the song I'm probably proudest of. Yeah, really. Yeah, I, I'm really. Yeah, I like it. I understand it, and I remember the person it was about yeah. <laughs> very well, and the frustration that he wouldn't take any risks at all, and the you know you see the end before the beginning has ever begun. Uh, that's what he was like. That, that and you know it, it's about a real person. That that was a, a, a large part of my my growing up, I suppose. Um, and he knows that it's about him. You know, I'm still in contact with him, um, and, and he's slightly apologetic for the way that he was, which is kind of great. <laughs> <laughs> slightly is good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You can be slightly sorry. <laughs> So like, um, but there, in the book you talk about um, being in between these like three records and a piano. Did that kind of yeah. like is that like uh, like did that inspire like the the music behind like because it's an interesting like navigation yeah. of a song. Did that kind of come from those three records or was it just the narrative because yeah. that definitely lands yeah. too. It it, well, it did come from from those three in that Andrew Oldham had put me in a room in the office with a piano. Now I don't play the piano, but he, he there was a record player and it was Tim Hardin, mm -hmm. Mama and the Papas, and oh God, what was the other one? Can't remember. Now. Oh, Pet Sounds, Pet oh, Sounds. There we go. Boys. Okay. Pet Sounds, Tim Hardin and Mamas and Papas, and he he shoved me in this room and he said, "Right, I want you to write something between all of those three. And I wrote, I'd like to walk around in your mind. But actually, I didn't write it then okay. because I don't play the piano. Yeah. Uh, so I, I took the records and I crept away with them. <laughs> <laughs> I kept them. Um, <laughs> but yes, I did play them at, at home. And I did write that song to be what he had asked for. Um, and yes, we recorded it, but it never came out. But I did put it on the end of the reissue of yeah. just another day. Okay, because listening through, like, was that wasn't the only one that was added on the reissue, right? Like, uh, um, uh, "Winter Is Blue" was that added on too? Okay, that "Winter Is Blue" love song, which was the B side of "Train Song." Uh, I'd like to walk around in your mind, and also a different version of a song I'd sung in Gaelic that I really didn't like, um, uh, with the four bonus tracks on the end of the, the CD version of Diamond Day, and I was good. I was glad to be able to put those on because it, it gave an idea of of maybe what I had been up to before Diamond Day. Um, uh, and so yeah, I was glad about that, and and also that I'd like to walk around in your mind was there. Uh, because that was the song I was most proud of, I think. Yeah. I think I was I was twenty when I wrote that. Wow. So. Because like it's it's interesting that you put because I think listening through I'm like at that point because I listen to stuff without like I just put it on and usually I'm driving when I'm listening so I I'm not seeing the context of what's going until later but like I'm like okay at this point this is a different session of some sort just because sonically it sounds <laughs> different but then songwriting and lyrically um it definitely does i guess harken to that before uh, uh going to the quest going to the journey in that sense like and like it's interesting like the the narrative that's written in uh just another diamond day that like uh details the journey and that kind of like this confusion before like and after reading and, and talking with you now in context, that makes complete sense. And like, it's really cool that you can incorporate it like that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I was glad to. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it? And I guess so. Cliff Richardson was supposed to record um, "Winter Is Blue." No. Okay. No, 
he, uh, I recorded Winter is Blue with a huge orchestra with right. <laughs> with Andrew Oldham. And I thought, yeah, oh, well, okay, this is great. They changed the tune a bit, but okay, I let them do it. Um, and it was going to be a single. And then when I went to the office, I was called into the office, and Tony Calder, who was Andrew's business partner, said, oh, well, we're not going to release it because Cliff Richard wants the song. I said, um, and I never believed him. <laughs> but in, you know, I thought, oh, this is just a way of yeah. <laughs> getting rid of me. Um, but later, when I came to know Andrew Oldham again, and he said, well, you know, it might just have been true because Cliff Richard did uh, record a Stone song called um, something, something to blue. I can't remember. Blue turns to gray. Yeah, blue turns to gray. He, Cliff Richard recorded their song Blue Turns to Grey and it turned out that Tony Calder had confused uh, my Picture is Blue with their Blue Turns to Grey and so he thought Cliff Richard wants your song so you know we can't put it out and that was it was a tragedy for me and I didn't know I didn't understand you know if I'd yeah. understood I could have put him right yeah but yeah. No, oh, in, that, aside from the, the, the it being shelved in a way, it's almost that first commercial flag. Look at it, it works, you know? <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it, it could have worked, that song. I think it, it was incorporated in a film later, but yeah, it, all kinds of things like that that happen when you're very young and you don't know anything about anything right can can, can really uh you know it was a bit traumatic <laughs> dramatic and traumatic uh -huh. um for for somebody so young and uh, really not versed in the way of the world at all well sounds like you're, you're better at it than i was <laughs> That's only because I get to spend time talking to people like you, <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, being thrown in a position where you're a teacher. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh my goodness, that's something I could oh, never. Like, How would you teach it? That's that's uh, <laughs> skill, such a skill. That's great. Um, like, pretend to know what you're doing. I got it. <laughs> but uh, uh, hopefully, it, hopefully, hopefully it pans. <laughs> hopefully they believe me. <laughs> but um Vashti, thank you so much for your time i dearly appreciate it. i've been so excited to chat with you the book is fantastic your work is thank so amazing and moving and i'm i'm glad so happy to hear that it's reaching more people and you're getting this feedback and i'm very very excited to hear this new tune with dravendra like <laughs> for me that's that's a double home run like because i <laughs> re recall hearing in another interview you weren't sure if you're going to do music again after this book so i'm super stoked mm -hmm. to hear that it's coming with devendra that's so exciting yeah, yeah it's lovely yeah it's really good yeah. so, <laughs> thank you so much it's been really good <laughs> Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig Podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.